Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about divergent and convergent evolution and how Darwin's and Wallace's theory of evolution contributed to that or how they explained divergent and convergent evolution. And what we're going to do in this video is that we're actually going to cover those two people. So we're going to cover Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace and explain who they were and how they contributed to the theory of evolution. So I'm going to read the dot point. Students will analyze from secondary sources on the historical developments of theories of evolution and use available evidence to assess social and political influences on these developments. So first I'm going to go and talk about early 1800s. So this timeline just goes from 1800s to 1900s because that was the most important time for the theory of evolution. Um, it was all published and all kind of cemented in this time frame. So first we've got that early 1800s. Um, from here to uh, from 1800s to about 1820s, that's when we had we had um, so scientists uh, believed or some scientists believed evolution did happen, but the thing is they didn't know how it happened. It's kind of like saying you know I'm like I know I'm thirsty. You can tell I'm thirsty, but I don't know why I'm thirsty. I mean, the reason why people are thirsty is often because they don't drink enough. But that not drinking enough part, that is what the scientists didn't really understand. So how evolution happened, they didn't understand, but they did believe that evolution did happen. Like that's, so early 1800s, they believed evolution happened, but they didn't really know how it happened. So they didn't know how things changed over time. They only, they only kind of knew that things maybe changed over time. So the idea of evolution was new. But no one really knew, like, no one had any ideas of how that might have happened, how things might have changed over the years. So, born, so in 1809, then Charles Darwin was born. So that, that here, 1809, that is when Mr. Charles Darwin was born. And this here is Charles Darwin. That's a picture of Charles Darwin right here. And that was obviously in the later years. Um, then he, for maybe for 20 years, he, so he started to grow up and then he was, was meant to go to medical school. He was meant to become a doctor. The first uni lecture he went to, there was someone who was um, dissecting, I think, dissecting a corpse. And he felt so sick that he knew he couldn't become a doctor. Um, so what he did instead is he went on a voyage, on a ship trip. So a voyage just means like he took a ship, took a ship. And that ship was called the Beagle um, and went for a six-year voyage. So a trip, a six-year trip. So his trip started in 1831. So that was right here. So a voyage. So the Beagle was the name of the ship. And his trip started in 1831. And it started in England. So he started, left in England and then went this way. He went down to South America, up the coast from South America, past the Galapagos Island. If anyone watched one of the last videos, the Galapagos Islands was where he saw those finches. He saw the finches become, he saw the one main finch, but also the smaller finches or different types of finches on the Galapagos Islands. Then he went further and past Australia. So he visited Australia as well. That's why we have Darwin as a city. It was actually named after Charles Darwin. And then he left Australia and went back past Africa to England again, right? So that trip, that was a long trip. Especially back then, you didn't have any planes. You just had your boat, and that took a long time. And he stopped all the way on, on between as well. He stopped on the different continents. That trip took six, took five years, um, but his that trip changed his view of life quite differently, uh, quite a lot. So what he did in different parts, he actually stopped in South America. He stopped in Galapagos Islands. He stopped in Australia, and he took um, fossils. He found fossils. He looked at the native wildlife in those areas and he compared them, right? So we had that word come up um, a couple of videos back. That was the comparative comparative anatomy. When you look at bones and you compare bones of different animals, and he found that most of the animals, especially vertebrates that he found had similar bone structures, which suggested to him as a common ancestry. Um, but yeah, the birds were of most interest to him because the birds kind of gave him this idea that natural selection might actually happen. 
And remember, natural selection kind of means that um, there are many selective pressures. So someone, some people have to survive, or not some people, but all organisms, all living things, have to be able to survive harsh conditions. And the, only the ones who are fittest. So it's the whole idea of the survival of the fittest. Survival of the fittest. So with the ones who are most adapt to their environments, those are the ones who will pass on their genes. These ones, so the only ones that are fittest, will have offspring. That means they're going to have babies. And that kind of explains how evolution might occur. Because if you have only the fittest surviving, then those traits will always be selected. And you can have a species changing over time, especially if the conditions change, if it becomes more dry or, or um, hotter or wetter or whatever it is, then you can have that survival of the fittest. And that makes new species or a different species. So he observed that during his trip, his six-year trip, and then he came back, and that was in 1836, he came back. So Darwin returns from the voyage in 1836. But by the time he, he had a fair idea of what he wanted to write about in terms of his theory of natural selection, but um, he didn't publish. So he, he did lots of experiments. So in between here, so this time from 1836, which is here, all the way to 1858, that's almost 25 years. What he did in, there, in that time is he did a lot of scientific experiments to test his theory. So in his garden, he did a lot of experiments. So he could see that maybe natural selection does occur and maybe that's how um, things might change over time. That's how evolution might occur due to natural selection. He did lots of scientific experiments and he still didn't, didn't want to publish. You see, there was 25 years of scientific experiments. He was very sure of it, but he didn't want to publish. And that's the second part of this dot point says, um, and use available evidence to assess social and political influences on these developments. Why did he not want to publish? If he was so sure about it, why did he not want to publish? And this is the, I guess this is the bit con controversial part. And I will um, explain as well. But he didn't want to publish because, first of all, his wife um, felt he was going against religion. And... Um, his wife feared that, feared hell, basically. Um, so his wife feared that if he were to publish, then he might go to, go to hell. So he was obviously quite nervous about, you know, laying down his wife and, and maybe even, even going to hell as well. Um, he also feared the church. So back then the church itself had a clear stance that, that, um, Natural selection, the idea of it would not be like he didn't feel he didn't feel the church itself would accept that idea. So one of the reasons why he delayed his his publishment was of because of the church as well, and also because he did, he didn't feel that society, so the people themselves, they, he didn't feel they were ready for that idea because that might change their beliefs, their their um, religious beliefs, and he was very hesitant. He didn't want to publish because. He felt there would be too much. He would be ridiculed. He would be made fun of. And um, people might be hurt as well. So he didn't publish for 25 years. Um, but what happened then is he got a letter from someone called Alfred Wallace. And that was in 1858. So this person here, Alfred Wallace. And he basically just gave him a letter. So he sent him a letter. And, and he just said, so Wallace was someone who was working in Malaysia. Or I think it's somewhere in Southeast Asia. And he was also working on um, different fossils. And he kind of suggested to Wallace, he didn't know um, Charles Darwin was researching natural selection. He didn't tell anyone or not many people. But Wallace um, actually wrote in his letter that he had this brilliant idea. And he thought that you know evolution might occur due to natural selection. So basically exactly what Darwin was doing for 25 years in his backyard in secret Wallace just says, I've got that same idea, even though he didn't know Darwin had that idea. But he sent a letter, he said, you know, what do you think about this idea? Now, do you think it's good? Do you think it's, you know, should I go on with this idea? So Wallace asked Darwin. Obviously, Darwin was panicking because he worked 25 years on this on this um, piece of work in terms of you know, the theory of natural selection, which was meant to be a book. And all of a sudden, some random person comes to him and says, I have that same idea, basically. And Charles Darwin was scared that he would publish before... Um, he could before Darwin could. 
So what he did is basically just very soon later, very soon afterwards, I think the same year or the year afterwards, he published his book. So he published, Darwin published his book, Theory of Natural Selection. Um, and the reason why we often call it the Theory of Natural Selection by Charles Darwin and Wallace is because they both came up with the idea, even though Darwin already knew about it 25 years beforehand, just hadn't published. Both of them still get, get credit for it, but Darwin gets more credit for it. But then they published, they put, he published the book, and um, there was quite a bit of backlash from the church and from his f former friends as well, and he was ridiculed a bit. But the good, f uh, f the good thing for him was that by the 1860s, so when he published in 1858, there was less, um, less, how should I put it, less outrage because the Industrial Revolution, so the Industrial Revolution had occurred, and people's mind had changed a bit. So the Industrial Revolution changed people's mind a bit, and it wasn't as outrageous anymore to make that claim that things had changed because of natural selection. But there was still a lot of outrage and still a lot of backlash as well. Um, but then he died, he died, so Charles Darwin died in 1882. Um, by 1900s, um, the theory of, of natural selection became more and more accepted. And nowadays, um, because um, for me, I think it's it's definitely, there's no problem if you believe in, in God or religion, and if you believe in um, evolution it's, as well. And most churches are, that I know of and most other many other religions um, do accept evolution. I know there are some that I don't, but overall, I think there's no problem at all if you're religious and believe in evolution as well. And I know that... Yeah, the Catholic Church, which was one of the, I think the Catholic Church was the one that that um, said no, don't publish that idea, or don't. Or they didn't like that idea initially, but I'm pretty sure that Catholic Church, the same church, now accepts it as well. So many people's minds has changed since then, and so has um, many of the religious um, leaders as well. So hopefully, again, I know there's a controversial topic, but it is a syllabus point that we have to cover as well. So. I hope that wasn't too bad. Um, but next is going to be a summary of the summary of the whole chapter.